Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to another edition of our Across Retail Talks after our summer break. My name is Reinhard Wienewater. I'm the publisher of Across Magazine, and I'm very pleased that so many people across Europe are here today. Our today's topic, in my opinion, a very, very special and important one, new concepts from around the globe. A top class discussion group is ready. Klaus Striebig will, as usual, lead this discussion as an expert moderator. And please take part in the discussion and ask questions. Use the Q&A function. And in the next few days, we will send a summary and a video of this discussion via our newsletter. So that's it from my side at the beginning. I now hand over to Klaus Striebig. Klaus, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Reinhard, and welcome back from the summer holidays. Everyone pretty well rejuvenated, relaxed, and full of power and energy. Uh, how to manage the retail future. Um, I have a great top-notch panel uh, invited. I'm absolutely happy to have all these uh, persons on stage, and we will introduce them um, in a few seconds. And um, new, globe, new concepts from around the globe. What was the reason behind that um, uh, topic from today? Um, retail. Retail is still a very important part in our life. Um, we know it for sure. In the past, retail was a simple supplier for requested goods and services. Retail now maybe tries to provide solutions because we have that much request <coughs> problems um, for the daily needs and wishes we have. And retail maybe will, and that's my prediction, somewhat connect with each individual consumer communicate on all existing channels we have, touches the heart of the consumer via all senses and help them to find out what they may need, but maybe not know so far. My personal point of view of retail, and let's see whether there's something exciting going on. I want to introduce um, our panel before we start with the questions. And of course, I start with our charming lady, Teresa. Teresa, who are you? <laughs> Thank you, Klaus, I'm good, thanks. Happy to be here. Teresa, you're from Fond Strategies. Could you give us a little sign? You are all famous because of your retail report. Most of the people know that, but what is Fond Strategies doing? Yeah, sure. I'll um, give you a short introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Managing Director of Fond Strategy Consulting. Fond Strategy Consulting is a strategy and innovation consultancy focus on retail, so future of retail. And future of retail, what you've mentioned in your personal opinion, um, it's so complex. So there are quite a lot of things we do uh, regarding the future of retail, especially digital transformation, of course, and um, about building new brands, new services, um, very consumer and customer based. So probably that's it. Um, but on the other hand, I'm also uh, yeah, publishing the retail report and a journalist of the Retail Institute, Sukums Institute. So I speak about a lot of societal trends um, regarding the future of retail. So I'm really happy to give some insights to that today. We will come back to that in a few minutes. I time. Think so, too. <laughs> so we do it clockwise. So V, welcome back from holidays. You look very well. And um, V is the CEO of Hunkemeller and... Um, yeah, I took uh, two weeks off to update my uh, tan, so I'm ready to go now for the uh, new uh, season. Yes, I'm, I'm V Patel, I'm Chief Operating, Operating Officer for Hunkamala. Uh, maybe most of you know it's uh, a brand which sells the ladies' lingerie now. Uh, we have roughly over 900 stores, uh, a very, very uh, strong e-com uh, platform, but much, much more importantly, we have a strong ecosystem, which we call the inner bit, which is the omni-channel which connects the two worlds uh, together. Uh, and uh, first of all, um, Klaus, thank you for inviting me. Um, I look forward to the next hour. Super, thanks for that, V. And we have Yoda, I don't know where he is at the moment, but sometimes he is uh, <coughs> in Asia, sometimes in Istanbul, sometimes in Germany, sometimes elsewhere. Yoda, welcome, good in. Hello, hello, welcome. Good afternoon and uh, happy seeing you, happy being here. And um, good afternoon to everybody listening to us. And um, you'll know I'm in Istanbul in our headquarters, um, FIBA Group, as you know, and a lot of participants as well. Founded 1987, it's a group with almost 70 companies. And um, we are in different branches and subsidiaries like um, banks and uh, insurances, retail, and um, we do have real estate worldwide, globally, and um, an own university, almost over 
12,000 employees worldwide and almost 50 nations. That makes us very proud. So we are very close to the world. And um, yeah, today many greetings from very nice Istanbul with almost 25, 26 degrees. And uh, I remember Berlin was uh, quite more, I mean, colder than here, Teresa. It is, yeah, it is, absolutely. <laughs> so Jura has two hats on his, on his head, you have to mention, because Diva Group is doing, on the one hand, real estate development, which is interesting. On the other side, they are covering some retail brands in their portfolio. And maybe we ask you later, Jura, why these brands have been chosen and what kind of brands you will see in your markets where you are or where you've been. Come back later to that. And we have Jan. Jan, Jan I think um, I have to say it's a, it's a big wish because I'm a big fan of Rachel's. Um, because that story is for me one of the best retail stories we had in the past, let's say, 15, 20 years. Jan, would you introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, Klaus, thank you. Uh, Jan Eising, um, uh, and the... Uh, uh, director of uh, real estate and expansion within Rituals, uh, joined Rituals actually in 2008. Uh, Rituals uh, two uh, actually started in 2000. Uh, so last year we celebrate uh, 20 years with Rituals, with uh, the opening of the House of Rituals. Uh, that was the only party we could have in COVID time. Um, for my department, I uh, have a team of 20 people sitting around Europe mainly where we uh, lead the expansion uh, of bricks. Um, now at the moment around 850 stores, uh, mainly Europe, a little bit US. Uh, we are active in Hong Kong. We are active with a partner in the Middle East. And uh, for next year, another 100 openings planned. Uh, Europe, Middle East, uh, new countries. Uh, Italy will be added from next year. We will go to Finland finally next year. And uh, this year we had a successful start in uh, Poland uh, with the first, uh, actually yesterday, uh, Baltitska, ACA Santa Claus. Uh, we, we opened yesterday and uh, another two to go. Super. And that's the reason why we invite these kind of successful retailers that even in pandemic times, they have to mention something successful. And I heard, um, Jan, that each and every employee gets this kind of environment you are living in at the moment. So because that's <laughs> the mood of rituals in your background, right? Yeah, that's the house of rituals uh, background or it's at least the mood. Uh, we, we use it a lot for the videos, but uh, yeah, when, you go, when you come to Amsterdam in the House of Rituals, you, you can see it live. Yeah, we, we need to, to discuss that later because I don't see products. Yeah. Um, maybe that's the secret of the oh. success. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Thanks for the introduction. So let's get started. Um, so people nowadays are more and more and much informed and behave and shop more self-conscious. So I think it's one of the trends we are seeing at the moment. So we see despite the driver and pacemaker pandemic that the change in consumer behavior has taken place. Theresa, what do you think are the biggest changes and what kind of new trends will touch the retail business mostly now and in the next few weeks and months? Give us a little insight about Retail Report 2021 and what's coming next. That's a really big question, Klaus. <laughs> Right. How many minutes do I have? So, no, it's quite complex speaking about changes and trends regarding the retail landscape. Um, but the good thing, most of the trends are not that new. Um, they actually started before the corona crisis, speaking about sustainability or connectivity and things like that, that actually, well, in fact, uh, customer behavior. But now and during corona, there is much more pace now and it's getting quite, quite fast at the moment. So um, what we see, I mean, we sit all at home. So we work from home for most of the time. So of course, e-commerce is rising up quite a lot, um, quite a lot. So, and this is also, of course, a consequence to stationary retail um, in a positive way um, also that we seek for new experiences, um, for new offers, for some localness, for some sustainable materials, products, services. Um, we see that well, the customer is quite lazy at the moment. Um, well, if you say it in a positive way, uh, they like convenient services, <laughs> convenient experiences. And we see it, I live in Berlin. Um, you're probably here in the background. Um, 
we do have so many instant deliveries coming up at the moment. So many retailers now are working on their logistics, um, delivering things within 10, 20, 30 minutes. And the interesting new thing is that people not only um, let food, for example, if food deliver, um, is also in the fashion and in the beauty and in the health sector, that delivery is one of the main driver at the moment in the retail landscape. But I mean, there are so many trends, um, especially security or health, for example. We see that health and well-being and um, the, the cozy background from Rituals is, is quite great for that. So I think this is rising quite a lot because people want to have something special and they want to care for themselves and for others and loved ones. And retail and products can be a very, very good thing due to that. Um, so yeah, basically what we've heard during the Corona crisis, connectivity, of course, with the e-commerce, with totally new store formats, like our automated stores, micro hub stock stores. Um, there's a lot of happening at the moment, but also like a counterpart, the sustainability, the new experiences, new services coming up. And this is quite new innovation also for the stationary retail world. Um, but I hope I do have one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> because you've mentioned it in the beginning that um, and I think this is a fundamental shift, actually, uh, even it sounds quite cheesy. Uh, you, you can't say this is the online world, this is stationary world. We are talking about hybrid concepts now. So what we see is that consumers um, regarded to convenience lifestyle, they want to interact with stationary stores. So they want to probably book some parking slots. Um, or wardrobe, um, when they are in, um, in stores, they don't want to wait um, so long to, to get something, to, to buy something. So a huge more technologies and interaction sessions coming up and actually consumers are using that now. And this was different at the time before Corona. Thanks very much, Teresa. I think we can talk much more minutes about that. And, um... But let's let's figure out what kind of let's say trend is the most important one. So you mentioned somewhat well-being or coziness mm -hmm. or laziness um, or convenience is the, the technical word of it. Um, is this it is is this on top of the agenda or is it um, is there a, le a let's call it a leading trend or leading new behavior? What do you think? Well, um, I actually don't think so because consumers are quite complex now i mean the most important trend i think is that we're coming from a me culture to a we culture so it's so everything is about connectivity whether it is about new marketplace strategies or it's about interacting with stationary retail so this mindset about i am in a community whether it's people talking with people or people talking with companies with retailers um, so i think this is something that really raised during the corona crisis and is a very fundamental for everything is coming up okay may i change the world complex consumer to individual con consumer that it's everything individual well uh individualization is is, is is a huge mega trend of course so um individualization cus customization is for example, uh, regarding products, services, etc., is a huge trend. But on the way, individualization has a counterpart, and this is the co-culture. And we see with sharing concept now, we see with community feeling in stories. So um, I think there is not the one side and the other side. We just see that we can't change the world just by myself, even though I would try it. And uh, it actually, um, the experiences are not that funny if you just do things by yourself. So it's... There is a huge demand now on co-culture, on sharing, on openness and communities. And I think this is definitely something that is um, very important for the next well, retail formats, um, marketplaces, interactions within the next years. Thanks so much, Teresa. It was a very nice introduction and an overview where we are consumer-wise. We have two retailers in our round who are, let's say, um, connecting with most of these trends, we and, and Jan, um, because you're selling products directly linked to your skin, if I may define that. We, and what are the success factors from Hunkemöller at the moment? Is this the reason why you're that successful with Hunkemöller, uh, this, this certain kind of trends? What's your point of view? And obviously, through uh, uh, Corona, uh, 
the major trend, obviously everyone's at home. We saw a huge spike, uh, everything to do with home collections, like nightwear, everything you wear around the house. But I think I just take one more step on from what Teresa said. I think for us, what we've seen, okay, in and out, in and out of the pandemic, because we've had lockdowns and no lockdowns and the lockdowns again, is on overall, we've seen a systematic, systematic shift in the consumer behavior, not just in terms of products they're buying like nightwear or whatever, because it's more of a stay home feel. But I think um, customers have become even more educated than they were before. So, uh, so in the way that they have plenty of time, they do a lot of deep diving on the internet in terms of, hey, this is the right product for me or whatever. And, and a quite clear example for us is that our, our conversion, I'll give you a number that we used to do, we, our conversion pre-COVID was sort of 25, 26%. Uh, customers coming in the store and right now we're embarrassingly at 35, 36, maybe 37 percent. So um, yes, it's all down to the COO who does a fantastic job. No, I'm joking. I think it's more to do with the fact that the customers are much more educated. They want to, as Theresa said, they want to make sure that they are um, uh, understanding their environment, understanding what they want. And then when they come in the shop, the job of uh, our staff is much, much more easier because that they are that much more educated. So we've seen a rise, a huge rise in conversion, a huge rise in basket value as well. Um, and, I, I, and I like the, the fact that one of your questions here is what's my biggest surprise after COVID is the strength of human nature to want to shop. And it's there, it's, it, it's, it's prevalent everywhere, you know? Yes, it was just online when stores are closed, but uh, I think the, the stores now, at least our stores are inundated with, with customers and traffic right now because they feel free and they, they feel that they've come out of this sort of uh, COVID cycle. Uh, but I think the shift in consumer behavior and sentiment is down to sustainability. Our sustainable products now, which we used to market Softly pre-COVID, we market much, much higher because there's more attention on people who are looking for that kind of product. And that's adding also to them looking at Hunker Muller, not just as a fast fashion uh, sell, but sell, uh, seller, but also one that is committed going forward to the environment as well. Thank, thanks, we um, one, one added question, please. So um, selling, let's say, homeware or nightwear is maybe... Somewhat sexy. Um, <laughs> please, please don't be um, um, negative. So, um, but what are you doing at the moment to delight and to inspire the customers? Because in the past, I know I knew Hunke Müller a bit more about the, all the other stuff you sell. Um, what, what is the, what is, what is your driver to inspire and delight the people? I think for us right now, it's on two areas. One is uh, we've now become a digital first business. So basically, we really drive tech through all our platforms of our business. And I would say our, our, our stores have become digital bricks um, over the last 18 months to two years. I'm gonna give you an example. Um, our e-com business um, is obviously very, very strong. Uh, in certain countries, 72% of every e-com order is picked up in a store. That just shows the engagement that the digital platform has with the brick platform and the fact that customer still wants a brick experience, could get the convenience from, from the digital, which is, which, are, which is totally acceptable, but they still find a way back. And when we, when we talk to, uh, uh, through our CRM to our Gen Z customer, they still really, really believe that the uh, uh, brick is still important to them. But however, they want a digitalized experience as much as possible in the brick. And I think that's one new aspect that we're adding even more attention to than we were previously adding pre-pandemic. It sounds great. I knew that Hünkemela is doing a fantastic job uh, multi-channel wise before COVID, but now you have, let's say, improved and practices um, fantastically. So congratulations. Um, I think many, many should follow uh, your, your thoughts and ideas. Jan, um, Jan um, you are also selling something which is linked directly to the skin, but in a different manner and way. Uh, what's your point of view on that? Um, how do you delight with uh, rituals and inspire the people to buy um, the products more and more and hopefully to better prices? Now, uh, what we saw in, in, uh, in COVID times when, when stores locked down, when we had all the lockdowns uh, yeah, all over the world, um, of course, uh, our e-com platform exploded. 
and um, I would say we ready we were ready for it in a certain way to 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 improve the business in the next two three years. But suddenly we had to do that in a couple of weeks. Uh, it was so busy that we uh, also all kinds of initiatives like a ship from store where we where someone ordered. Uh, for a delivery in, in Hilversum, for example, in the Netherlands. It was directly shipped, uh, directly uh, redirected to the store. And we shipped it from the store, actually, and not via the central uh, warehouse because the capacity was not uh, high enough. So that was something what was uh, in development. So we had to do it really quickly. And also, like V says, uh, 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 click and collect. It was not really big, but now with all people not uh, couldn't go into stores, they had to pick it up at the store. So all kinds of initiatives, uh, uh, yeah, develop more quickly than uh, than possible. Uh, luckily, we see now that uh, stores open, uh, all stores are open again. Uh, read of the, the the people who normally shop bricks, like so in stores, they also say they they find the combination now. So they say, listen, for repeat by it's so easy to stay online but uh, happily we are also a product people want to discover and want to smell and to see uh, what we also saw in covid uh, really increase of uh, home products so people had yeah spent more time obviously at home had more uh, willing to spend more money on candles fragrance sticks and things like that and uh, we saw really an increase there and that's uh, that's staying Super. Um, you did something unusual for a retailer these days. You opened your biggest store. You mentioned it, or you called it House of Retails. It's yeah. an amazing store in Amsterdam. I think I don't like the word flagship, to be honest. But um, it looks great. And uh, the, the picture in the back is something that gives us a hint how it looks like. What was the reason for that move? Uh, now we do two things, because we, we already had a plan besides house of rituals to, to upside stores. Well, we see where we have uh, in, in some countries uh, like Germany, France, Holland, we really had to upsize the, the, the sales space. And, and we have discussions with landlords and telling us e-com will become bigger. And our trend is that we need bigger stores. And it's not because we need a bigger back of house. Now we need a bigger front of house where we can show our products and, and where we see already if people uh, have more space to shop and if we see more dwell time people stay longer and there's a bigger basket at the end at the exit and coming to your question how's your rituals yeah there was a long dream of uh, our founder Raymond uh, to have a sort of yeah flagship department store thing uh, he's more calling it his uh, laboratory where he can invent new things for the for the, the next uh, rituals so um, we looked long, long time to for, for that building because it was we we had the idea that it had to be uh, the, the yeah the next level rituals with the normal rituals products we sell, but also what can we sell different. Uh, then we looked to buildings. We looked at buildings with hotels, with restaurants, all kinds of things. Uh, we looked all over Europe, but then we said now we have to do it in Amsterdam, uh, close to the head office because. It's really, uh, besides a lot of CAPEX, it's also, we have to be close to on top of it. Uh, and then uh, at the end, we found this building. It's called uh, the old Esprit building. Uh, 30 years Esprit was in that uh, Africa house in the middle of Amsterdam. It's a single uh, building. Uh, uh, I think in the past, it was a department store and uh, we developed it in, uh, let's say two years time. Uh, into this uh, great rituals, house of rituals. And when you enter, the ground floor is like normal rituals, but in a different presentation and more service. And, but then you go to the first floor and there is the next rituals. You find travel, you find uh, bed linen, uh, bathroom, uh, all kinds of things we're not selling in, uh, in normal ritual stores. But what we do with that, we get that endless aisle. So next year, or at the end of the year, we will offer it online and the sale in all our stores. We have that inspiration in store and you can order by your own device or via a platform in the store. You can order this, uh, these products. Uh, the next thing is when you go to the third floor, there is that great 
Um, it's called a uh, urban spa. So you have treatments, you have massage, everything uh, in one floor. And it's really, people can go in, uh, don't expect it, but yeah, we try to have always place open for hand, feet, massage, and you can have that treatment for, uh, let's say, in the big, <laughs> busy city, Amsterdam, you can have uh, 20 minutes to an hour for yourself. And then we have some completely new on the fourth floor, uh, which is called um, the Brain Spa. And the Brain Spa is, is a little bit developed by a lot of people get panic when their battery of their iPhone is like three or four percent. And they just, where's the charger? I need to recharge. But they don't do it for themselves. They just run on and go on and go on. So we developed this brain spa where you have a check-in. First, you have to go on a digital uh, platform where, you, where we check where you are, uh, your well-being, uh, your stress. Uh, and, and then you go, you can choose for different programs. Uh, one of them is you go in a sort of cabin and you have 25 uh, minutes um, really relax. So it's with sound, noise, uh, lights. And yeah, I did it twice. And also the second time after 10 minutes, you're gone. And you wake up 20 minutes later and you completely, yeah, not brainwashed, but uh, recharge actually. And we have several programs on yoga on, uh, on that floor. And this is really something new, still trying to tweak it, develop it, but it could be the next thing. We could use it for hotels or airports or uh, whatsoever. So um, that's really, really nice. And on the ground floor, there's also uh, a thing we, ne we have uh, never done before. It's a really a nice restaurant. It's called Rui. Uh, we uh, developed it with a great uh, star chef from uh, Amsterdam. And uh, it's open. Yeah, we want to open and it was COVID. So but now it's open, finally. We have a back terrace outside. We have a nice restaurant inside. So uh, yeah, for, for Raymond, it was uh, uh, his own present for 20 years rituals. And uh, we could not celebrate yet, but uh, please, I want to invite you to come to Amsterdam and uh, discover it yourself. Thank you so much, Jan. I'm a, I'm a little bit afraid that you have 100 more customers the next few days. Oh, um, no problem. <laughs> so, and I, I see that on my top list, um, where to go to next next few months will be Amsterdam. Uh, but could that be a benchmark be um, to develop a brand like Rituals we all know? In that stage, this is this is absolutely top notch um, development on my point of view, and uh, I hope we see much more of these. V, could you consider that also for Hünkemeller next few? Um, yes and no. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Raymond, uh, I know Raymond, and a founder has a different view from a business that's run by private equity. So we have a cynical uh, uh, take on it. Uh, our business runs in an entirely different way, but ultimately I think we share uh, the same principles about uh, the service, the environment, the personal touch. So that won't go, but for us to be able to, to do that and commercially justify it and then expand on it, uh, given the, uh, the type of ownership that we have, uh, you get me what I'm saying. Uh, um, so yeah, it, it's much, much more uh, more difficult for us. I, I know it's a little bit provocative, but it's one of my, my, <laughs> my targets, um, knowing that we have a discussion how retail is working and how retail is evolving um, from a, let's say, PE, private equity point of view, or from a point of view which is a little bit more, let's say, uh, owner-driven like Raymond Klosterman. Um, so uh, interesting point of view. Let's get um, come switch to Yura. Yura, um, I mentioned it already, has two heads um, on his head. And um, the FIBA group has a lot of brands in their portfolio. And I would love to know, um, Yura, from your point of view, based in Istanbul, uh, you are working with a lot of international brands um there's maybe a reason why you're working not only in istanbul with your with your commercial properties you're doing also something in the eastern part of europe same in china asia so um question one is why have you chosen this kind of brands are they really that successful and do you consider more um the provocative and what is your point of view if you compare your market where you are in with each other you know um, first of all, um, Jan and um, also um, a visit to Amsterdam, I think, will be a must because uh, our headquarters of uh, our 
bank, Credit Europe Bank, almost close to the Ajax Amsterdam Stadium. This is not far, so um, I will join Klaus for the next visit of your uh, House of uh, Retails. I mean, very interesting and looking also to this, how, I mean, uh, retail is developing and um, getting new ideas and um, new ways as well. Um, well, first, I think in general, um, yeah, the pandemic, I mean, we all know, and uh, I think all participants as well see, I mean, the um, development of the online commerce, e-commerce, so what we face, and um, like Teresa said, uh, said, I mean, we have also kind of hybrid models, and um, there will be, I mean, um, operational financing ch challenges uh, in general, we will see lenders which were, I mean, using um, all kinds, let's say, in the past of uh, real estate products uh, will change. There will come alternative, um, for example, uh, companies and organizations. So we will see repurposing of, I mean, a lot of um, assets and products as well and resizing and reshaping not only in the functions, um, but also from the commercial point of view, commercial real estate point of view, as well from the point of the retailers. Um, in the past, I mean, in our group, we do have Marks and Spencer, Gap, Banana Republic, as you mentioned. Um, this was, I mean, I'm uh, joining almost now nine years uh, FIBA group. And uh, in times where we had in our portfolio of Finance Bank, um, this companies uh, joined uh, Turkey first, then also Russia and Ukraine. So we're um, serving in uh, almost 300 million, I mean, uh, population, Marks and Spencer, Gap and Banana Republic. Um, when you have a bank and when you are working with the bank as well, I mean, um, then you can lend also um, nice products as well, where you can find synergies and to increase values. But um, these are brands quite well. Um, we are happy. Yes, in the future might be new ones as well. I mean, there's always a question. We have a great team. We have a great uh, managing director. So um, all participants listening here um, and interested and maybe have seen, for example, um, when I'm talking now for Turkey, we are globally um, in the business, but um, maybe the second half um, or the second quarter was a big success of almost 20% uh, uh, growth. I mean, that was not expected like that. So um, there are definitely opportunities um, in terms of... Um, the, the future, I mean, what I see is that um, definitely e-commerce online will become um, more um, increases. Um, today, maybe they have 18% of the global retail. They will have maybe 2025, let's say um, 23, 24%. But nevertheless, people will not stay home. I mean, we had in the different countries, starting from China with the pandemic, where we did our first, I mean, um, experience with the pandemic. And then it went over to, I mean, Asia to Eastern Europe and then to Western Europe. Um, that we have seen a lot of lockdowns and um, above all after lockdown, I mean, which is crucial for all of us, is that the people, um, are more, as uh, we said before, um, educated, which makes the companies and brands more competitive because they know more. But the people were out. I mean, we have reached numbers like in 2019, even we, I mean, overcome that numbers in terms of turnovers as well, in terms of um, conversion rates as well, because the customer knows very well what he wants to buy. I mean, above all the Z generation, for example. So. Um, they become more efficient. It's not only effective, more efficient. So we need to provide all of this and to make, to satisfy them. I mean, from the coming points, from the car parking or whatever, public transport, entering to a commercial real estate and then really following their path. I mean, to find what they have, I mean, in mind and um, that makes really more efficiency, also in turnovers, so that shows us, and that was a big surprise for me as well, after lockdown, how intensive people and um, visitors are coming back. And um, there are new products, definitely, what we see, which will change. Um, we will have in um, grocery or food and beverage. Uh, entertainment will also, I think, come back, will be very interesting, leisure as well. We need some time regarding hotel, and um, because that it's maybe three to four years 
to come back to pre-COVID times. Um, and we see that also by financing when you see today um, that um, banks, I mean, are looking for city center uh, hotel locations, for example, or resort locations. And the LTV is by 50 to 55. I mean, I think it's three, four years, it goes up to 60, 65, maybe to 70 again. So um, nevertheless, um, Teresa said as well, I mean, the logistic is very important. If a customer or visitor cannot find something special in rituals or Hundkunkemuller, um, then they go e-commerce the same day, and if they are lucky, they get it even in the evening. Yeah. So um, the retailers need to be very much prepared. It will be not only online, it will be also stationary. I mean, that's clear. But um, it needs a great training, and we are not, at the end, I mean, we still do our experiences. We still do, you know, our homework, and we, we learn a lot new. And... Um, but we should never forget our experiences from the past, which helps us a lot. I cannot imagine that we are not celebrating in Amsterdam or in, in, in Brussels or in, uh, in, in, in Berlin Christmas. I mean, people will go out to the markets. I cannot imagine that we will not, uh, I mean, entertain and uh, celebrate uh, Bayram festivals in the Emirates or in Turkey, for example or um, schools are opening, reopening, thanks God. I mean, these all combined with the new ideas and new challenges. I mean, House of Rituals can be a great story for Amsterdam. Maybe this is a flagship and landmark story, you know, to invite us, for example, to talk with us, maybe a potential cooperation <laughs> or doing something well, but does it fit somewhere else is another question, you know, does it fit in China, for example? So. We need to see as well. I mean, when I look to the collection rates, I mean, the, uh, cl I mean, classical questions all around. What is the, I mean, collection rate in your, I mean, office or shopping malls? Or, I mean, what is the, uh, how much is uh, the center covered? I mean, it's a 98, 99%. I can tell you, I mean, we have today 95% plus collection rates and uh, the centers, I mean, are 97.8 uh, plus. And these are from the global view, I mean, from China, Eastern Europe to Turkey. And um, we even still now think about enlarging one more again. So um, also offices, for example, we need to see that, I mean- Come back clearly, to retail, come back to retail, Yura. Yeah, but offices again, because you mentioned, I need to tell you that it's also interesting. It's combined in mixed use clouds, therefore I'm mentioning it. And we are looking for mixed use projects as well. We have, for example, downsized the project in Romania and uh, we've seen huge competition, but we then repurpose the product from 50,000 retail to 40,000 and have then added 10,000, for example, offices. And the people are coming back again. And um, this gives also some additional values as well. But um, I think we're still learning. We will still do our experiences and the biggest challenge is um, when we com combine the um, economical crisis with this pandemic crisis, while economic crisis, there were no liquidity in the market. Today, there is liquidity, liquidity in the market. There's money in the market. But how to lend, how to invest, and where to invest, I mean, that's great efforts for all of us and there we all need to come closer together retailers as well as commercial real estate companies investors and lenders i mean this is a common maybe this is a new program for you a new panel to go to this direction which makes maybe the products hopefully more sustainable and more um successful thanks for that you for that great overview and uh... And the hint what to do next. So uh, let's come back to the last minutes for retail. This was our topic. And, uh, and there's still a hunger of retail, I, I suppose, um, which is good to know. Teresa, um, we talked about success factors of um, successful retailers in that panel. Um, if you see the success factors in retail and your trends uh, in the consumer behavior, does that all match? Or is there something you would add as a new retail success factor? Um, very interesting question because, well, there is a lot of going on at the moment in, in the retail landscape. And um, I think what the most 
interesting uh, change is the variety of different shop formats for small size and downsize things and very um, hybrid and uh, technology driven stores and large experience stores. So there's a lot of going on, uh, going on especially um, driven by technology and digitalization and connectivity with the consumer. This is something that the consumer wants actually, but if we face the reality, um, of course, not the participants here, but if we face a reality within uh, retail companies, we see that there is so much to do um, regarding internal processes and structures and digitalization. So digital transformation is a huge, huge challenge for many retailers, um, and uh, especially in Germany or in Europe, um, we do have a lot to do to actually face the real um, consumer demands at the moment. Um, because I think one of the most important is a buzzword, I know, but it's all about seamless, seamless services, seamless office. And um, this is a very complex challenge for many retailers. So it is quite interesting and many, many retailers try their best. And we see all these interesting tests and tries and varieties at the moment. But uh, we are now in an interesting step for professionalization of these internal and digital processes. And um, so I was really interested listening to uh, what um, Jan said um, at Rituals, because I think this is a very, very interesting concept for the future. Super, thanks for that. So you see the situation that not only the product, the offer is important, it's also the back of house um, um, or the, the, let's say, the, the organizational standpoint. The Organization, standpoint. exactly, yeah. We have now two, let's say, challenges on the one hand uh, to, let's say, touch the heart of the consumer and uh, to touch, let's say, the door, the doorman ringing in a, in, a, in, a, in a friendly manner and that it's all fitting to our, let's say, daily needs or personal needs. Exactly. So, if you could name one or two or three, you can choose um, concepts from wherever of the globe, uh, Theresa. Um, what do you think, except of those ones who are sitting in the panel, um, mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of concept would you consider as a real interesting, hot, um, well-prepared one? Um, or, or your pers personal, or you like it mostly by yourself? Because mostly by myself. Um, I mean... Pfft. I think there are quite some interesting concepts at the moment. Um, well, at the moment, you, you, you can travel so much, but I was in New York a few weeks ago, and I've seen an initiative from eBay and Louis Vuitton, and uh, they have all these vending machines in New York where you can buy, um, buy Luxus bags, for example. Um, so I think that is quite, quite new, and I really liked it, especially in the luxury fashion branch. It's quite new these spontaneous vending machines concepts um, and I've also been in the Lego new flagship store and this is a absolutely new uh, digital hybrid experience um, every product is linked with Nifield communication and you can learn so much about um, environment about sustainability um, about of course building something up um, and it is about 600 square meters um, so it is big, but not that big what we've seen in the past regarding two flagship stores. So I think this is also interesting that you have the maximum experience um, on, well, on, on a size that is not these flagship stores you've seen in the last years or years before. So I thought these ones are quite, quite interesting. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of going on at the moment regarding digitalization and mobilization in the market. Super, thanks for that. A nice range uh, from Lego to Louis Vuitton. Yeah, um, your point of view. And um, what do you think, which kind of, which colleagues from retail industry have to be showed, uh, showed in that panel um, if you travel around the world and do your expansion? What have you seen, which is really a good benchmark? Well, um, my first my concern is that after now we open up again and we're going and to the third, uh, fourth quarter this year. Uh, my concern, hopefully, we, a lot of retailers still are there and after uh, support of, uh, of, of governments and landlords and uh, hopefully we will uh, survive. So that's my first concern that the streets will, the, 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 the retailers will be there so the people are coming back and not for empty stores. But yeah, on, on trends, well, what, what Theresa said, I see a lot of uh, uh, digital first, 
there's a small, um, not small anymore. It's called My Jewelry. In, it's also now going to Germany. And that lady is 32. She started at 22 uh, selling her stuff on Instagram. It's a uh, small jewelry things and also some clothing now. And it went well. And suddenly she said, maybe I should try a store. And now I think she has over six or eight stores, uh, 240 selling space. So it's not also not so from small stores to big stores. And I think that is uh, coming from uh, young entrepreneurs uh, and the other way around from, from digital to actually bricks and uh, still her uh, share of uh, uh, selling on e-com is higher than bricks, but she's surprised that e bricks will go to 50% of her turnover, I think, already. So uh, people do want to discover, to feel, to see it, and uh, at the end, they will buy it wherever. And that's a little bit, um, yeah, everybody has this, uh, this nice machine. And we, it's called the shop. It's called, uh, it, this is our customer card. When you have the rituals app, it's not there's a shopping, but it's also uh, yoga. There's also relax. There's also it's it's more a yeah well-being thing app to feel uh, great for yourself with rituals. Uh, but you also can order products, and it's a little bit like uh, yeah the, yeah it's uh, I don't like the word omni-channel, but yeah the, the customer at the end decides where to buy, when to buy. And we are in discussion with landlords and about the back of house and, and about contributions and the back of house should not be too big. you turning stores into distribution centers. Well, at the end, the customer decides they can have it delivered at the office, at home, wherever. And uh, we just have to follow and to be on top of it and be, uh, yeah, service our customer. Okay. Any more accommodations except of the Marjorie lady? Um, what do you see? Um, no, also, I was not traveling that much in the past. So what I see now, and that's also a trend, when I go to Zurich or I go to Munich, I see a lot of empty stores, big boxes, empty. Uh, so that's what, that's a trend. So hopefully we can turn that around. But uh, it's not a trend, but it's uh, it's concerning. Yeah, okay. V, um, if, we, if you ask you, because you are um, operating from all over the world and um, you are more or less in, on each continent so far. So I would love to come back to Rükemeller, if you allow, uh, how you enter, have entered these markets, what kind of differences you see, let's say, between Europe, US, or Asia. And of course, if you have some benchmark for us as well, um, if you compare it, me, what your, what's your point of view? And how do yeah, you... I mean, first, first of all, obviously, uh, we've, uh, similar to Richards, we've gone through an expansion journey over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> at our height, we were opening one store every three days. And I think when we entered markets in the past, it was through brick. Um, but I think the shift about for us came about three or four years ago, and I'll give you a typical example of Switzerland. For instance, Switzerland was always, yeah, you know, one day we'd like to go there, but we've got a lot of work to do in Germany. And then we see that our wholesale partner, in this case, Zalando, making a lot of sales of Hunkerwall products in Switzerland. So automatically, you got information that a market exists for your product. And that makes it easier. And for now, I think for us, where, as I said in the past, where we would go brick, e-com, and then wholesalers, in this case, digital wholesalers, I think our modus operandi now in terms of expansion will be digital wholesale, then our e-com platforms, followed by, followed by brick. And I think, um, look, digital wholesalers are nothing more than the digital department stores of the future. So uh, Zalando is Calfolk, but digitalized, right? And I think that's why uh, you get uh, uh, the older department store chains really suffering because the new brands uh, tend to appear on, uh, on these platforms. And I think that um, is a surefire way for you to get your name out in the market quickly in that certain uh, area of the world. And that's how we take expansion on now. But we, we're still... Uh, predominantly a, um, a, a, an omni-channel omni retailer. Uh, our our e-com business pre-COVID was 20%. Obviously, in the last uh, 18 months, it's 45, 50% and going up. It will come down again, obviously, with stores being open once again. 
but we see it slightly different. We we would be happy by 2025 if we had a 50-50 split without without having to damage too much of our store portfolio. So uh, there's at least in our mark in our product range, it's a fragmented market. So there's still a lot, a lot of market share to grab without feeling that you have to compensate brick stores for the uh, ever-increasing uh, presence of, uh, of digital sales for us. And I think if I look around the world, uh, obviously I don't travel as much as I used to, uh, but um, I take a couple of retailers and I think pre-COVID, I, I was always a big fan of urban outfitters purely because they, they were changing their concepts, had lots of new brands in there and, and made people sort of want to come back in and again. I see a brand in the UK called End, E-E-E-N-D, which does a similar thing, uh, urban, urban product, sneakers and so on. But their, their shift is they talk with Nike and Adidas to get the, uh, the lines which are collectibles. Um, and they use that through social platforms and social media to drive the traffic into their stores. And I think that's, that's a concept which I think will grow. Uh, it connects the brick with social media traffic and then back into the stores and then have uh, showcase pieces, uh, quick selling lines, which uh, urge the consumer back in. And I think that there is going to be some sort of 360 approach in terms of retailing because we've all seen over the last 10 years major brands trying to get people online, um, which is great, uh, with online specials, uh, sales starting earlier online than in stores, just to drive traffic in. But uh, refreshingly, I, I, I do see a turnaround where uh, we'll be announcing that collections will be launched in stores first, and then back online, just so you complete the mix in the right way and give stores a focus and a reason to be. I think for us, uh, when you're a total omnichannel player rather than just a pure player, pure players have a lot of work to do with supply chain, with uh, customer acquisition, et cetera. Well, when you have a base of stores, that helps with the supply chain because the product's partially in there. And customer acquisition is not a problem because we're making members every day. Um, I think at least for us in our business, and I'm sure Jan shares the same opinion, I think for us, the two will coexist uh, going forward. Um, and I think pure players will soon find out that their cost of supply chain, which is ever increasing, is the one area which stores can uh, compensate for and help. And I think all will be looking to find some brick traffic. My, what, I, what, I, what I would like to finish on is, I think the pandemic has obviously gonna bring a, a new light uh, into the high street, under the shopping centers. There is more space. I like Jan, hopefully feel that that space will be taken over, but I'd like it to be taken over by independence because I think if you can bring variety back into the high street, which we all know has been overshopped throughout Europe with the same old brands everywhere. And we'll, we're a culprit of that as well. Um, I'm hoping that uh, new independence will uh, able to find a new, uh, a new rental which works for them and be able to express themselves and their new brands or new concept onto the high streets and that itself that variety will bring people back onto the streets and because they can see the high street is full of 50 new brands which they've never heard of but they're interested in buying and so on and so forth so um covid hasn't been great for a lot of people but i'm hoping that will that will, there will be a new form of retail uh, born out of it for sure I'm, I'm absolutely sure and thanks for that great insight and the change of retail in the model and the approach how you do it and if I, I, I understood everything right that means um, you see that there's indeed no borderline um, you can't differentiate between let's say continents little retailers little retail companies could appear grow like hell um, if they are touching all their points and the opposite around and um, that gives us a little uh, i would say a good feeling that retail yeah. will still yeah. have uh, the chance to grow and it's not only the big guns it's all the wall the, the, the small the individual ones who could I, have international I fully agree with Jan on that last subject about that little company that he talked about that started off from instagram in eight years 
I would love to see more of those people. And now if you wanted to start a brand like that, you'd have to have four, 500,000 worth of marketing money. All you now is need a phone and a camera on the back of the phone, and then you're off. Uh, and that's, that, that's fantastic. Super. Thanks for that great discussion. So uh, I'm a bit afraid because our followers know normally that we are trying to raise questions from the audience, which we have somewhat forgotten because it was too exciting. Uh, I have to apologize for that. Um, so if you have questions from the audience, uh, please send them via, via mail. We would love, I think that's the kind of service I offer now, uh, Reinhard. Um, uh, if there are several questions, we could uh, send them to our panelists because we have still just four minutes to go. And Yoda, um, I need, I need um, to start the last round and I would love to start with you if you allow. Um, um, if you might advise the retail industry in general and you are in touch with the retail industry, What, be, what would be your top three recommendation for them? Just recommendations. And please name your absolute favorite international brand. One minute. I mean, that's difficult um, with the last question because I have more than one. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, they're in the same range, so I need to be fair. Um, let's say um, regarding the brands and... Um, I think um, we need all look more to other countries and also to Asia. I mean, there are so many brands in China as well. I can mention here just quickly, I mean, like Pure Cotton or Hot Wind or Able Jeans. I mean, they can easily come to Western Europe and uh, Eastern Europe. So uh, these are great brands. Uh, above all, they know business, they know fashion. I mean, they were producers today, they have their own brands. So there in China, so many favorite brands. I, I, I have a favorite brand, which is For example, number 113, and uh, which is also amazing. Or um, there are sports brands like Anta Sports. So China is a new world. I mean, when again um, the opportunities are there for traveling, please travel to that country and to Asia above all China. They are setting up their new and own brands and very strong. So um, on the other hand, um, also. I mean, there are many brands in Turkey, for example, coming to Eastern Europe, just to mention it. I mean, there are a lot. We just brought over to Eastern Europe more than 30 concepts. I mean, they're still hungry to go further. There be, needs to be a closer, I mean, warm welcome and a closer, let's say, um, collaboration, which is important. Name, name them. You're the, name and, them. Uh, I name you all. I mean, this is oh. Dana Tween and uh, great, I mean, stuff uh, like selling, I mean, suits from... Um, Uh, Loro Piana, and so on and forth, and Elsie by Kiki, Spenti, De Ecru, De Facto, so um, Peely, and uh, there are so many others, Penti, which would be then for Hunker Miller, a uh, competitor, but nevertheless, more competition makes, I mean, more results in the positive manner. So um, there are so many companies as well, and also in Eastern Europe, I mean, companies, whereas we need to see, we need to find out, and We need to get away from this boring views, as you said, I mean, in the high streets, when you go to London, you see 70% the same brands as you see, I don't know, in Berlin, as you see somewhere else. Um, my favorite brands are, um, well, I have a bicycle store found now um, in a previous department store, which changed the purpose. So um, there I bought some bicycles for me and my whole family. And um, it's a nice one. There are a lot of examples. And uh, this is something different than the normal use. But by the way, when I did this experience, we have also now signed a contract with a nice company to bring them in one of our malls in Eastern Europe. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Jura. <laughs> Jan, now it's your turn. Um, your favorite name, brand, and one or two accommodations as short as possible, please. Oh, it's difficult to name a brand. Uh... I think a lot of retailers redeveloped themselves in COVID times. Uh, like I think Fiat from multi-brand, they go back to their, their own brand and they, they really make it strong. Uh, I like the example of bicycle stores. It's a little bit like people, there was more market in, more money in the market. So you discovered that you will not go to that multi-buyer, the, the Decathlons of the world. You go to that special, specialized store with a special bike and you, you bought it. Uh, I like that development. Also, rediscovering the coffee uh, again. Uh, I think there's a, there's a lot of uh, great initiatives from startups. And it's possible because there's a lot of property available 
for temporary on the different costs so they can have a lot of uh, pop-up like stores. I, I like that. Uh, and like uh, V said, let them come to the high street because then uh, the customer will follow. Super, thanks. We something to add? You have already made some accommodation, but one more? Uh, well, I'd like just to make one one of your questions right at the end of your topic uh, on the pages was well, three uh, point three points to take away. Uh, and for us yeah, at Honkamola, the three things that we're looking at is product, speed, and service. And I think they're the three things that uh, will uh, help. If we focus on that, I think that, that it falls in line with what the customer's expectations will be. Super, I, you can't better summarize it. Uh, and now it's Teresa, uh, the last one in that round with her personal uh, best accommodation from the international markets. I'll make it short, but uh, well, I consult um, retailers. So my recommendations are, well, um, be brave nowadays uh, during a time of digital tra transformation, have a strong vision and uh, be prepared for many investments you need to do during the digital age. And my favorite brand is, um, we've mentioned it before, I'm a luxury girl, so it's Louis Vuitton because they are quite data-driven, or they, in the beginning of being quite data-driven. Um, I think this is very, very interesting to, well, see what's going on during the next years with Louis Vuitton. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is, uh, I have never ever bought something at Louis Vuitton, but I'm absolutely amazed what they are doing retail-wise. So that's a fantastic story. It was a fantastic round. Uh, thank you so much to all my panelists. Um, we could talk much more hours uh, together. Maybe we have a follow-up, whatever, or whatever we <laughs> see. Um, it was great. Um, I think the audience was uh, absolutely in the 60 minutes band on screen and um, on their speakers. Now I head back to Reinhard. Uh, Reinhard, uh, what's next? And what could we expect from across? And thanks to all and um, have a nice time. Yeah, thank you very much. Many thanks again from my side. It was extremely exciting, informative and entertaining. Thank you very much. And uh, also thank you for so many valuable ideas and inputs we now have for our future editorial work. That's, that's great. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, we will make a summary. We will make uh, a video and we will send it out uh, with our next newsletter to our 30,000 subscribers. You will receive it within the, the next days. Many thanks to the panelists, uh, Klaus and, and, and me, we are working uh, on our next panel. We plan it to do, in, to do it in, let's say, uh, mid of October, roughly speaking. Um, yeah, we will keep you updated. Many thanks uh, for watching. Uh, we hope to see you again at our next Across uh, uh, Retail Talk. Yeah, greetings from Vienna and goodbye. All the best. See you. Enjoy. Yeah, see you. Stay healthy. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. See you in Amsterdam.